Oh, thank you so much for doing this. I'm so grateful to you. Well, thank you for having me. This is exciting. You know, I know it's not exciting. You've done like a gazillion of these things. It's been a while. It's exciting. Trust me. <laughs> I'm so happy. So, so tell, so tell everybody out there where you are. You, you look like you're in a cabin in the woods. Yes, and as you can see, it's getting dark already. I'm in Portland, Oregon, where we have a house and uh, we spend a lot of our time. I have a daughter here and a granddaughter and a son-in-law, and you know. Um, and it's very beautiful. I, I grew up on the East Coast outside of Philadelphia, and it feels very much like where I grew up. When Does I Does it grew really? Up. Yeah, because it's so lush and green and, and you know, there's actual weather. It's you know, So you didn't you weren't a city. You weren't a city, Philadelphia city. No. no, I would go to the city, but I did not live in the city. I never really wanted to live in the city. So uh, this was I always I, even when I was 10 years old, I somehow imagined. I would live in the Northwest. I didn't even know what the Northwest was, but I knew it had trees. So, <laughs> but you had a good imagination for a, yes, <laughs> yeah. which which has served you well. Yes. So, are you an Eagles fan? Because they absolutely just okay. Yeah, no, so you and Snuffy Boy, because they destroyed the Cowboys. He's yeah. not happy about that. Yeah. No, I'm an Eagles fan, and I just prepare myself every year to have my heart broken when they make it to the Super Bowl because that's what happens. So, you know, um, what can you do? Well, this year might be different. They're, Could be. They're, Could they're be. kind of right. They're kind no, of right. No, they are. The... They're amazing. Although they were last year too. So, but we'll see. Well, all right. Well, I can't be talking like this, or I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll be trained. So, so Marshall, you know, something really touched me today. I, I watched a whole lot of videos and 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 got to know you some, and. Um, when you and Ed were getting your Patty Chayefsky WGA award, the music they played you on with was the 30 something theme. Yes. And I realized that's kind of like the theme. You, It's kind of like your theme song kind of around <laughs> when you go around. Is it not? I don't, I don't know if I have a theme song, but I certainly would accept it if 30 something were the theme song. Um, it was written by some guy. I'm trying to remember who it was. He was a nobody. Uh, <laughs> snuffy, snuffy, snuffy Walden, snuffy Walden. Yeah. Well, that's how you come to me. That's how I, I have come <laughs> to meet you. And so, so we're going to go back and talk about a lot of things, but let's sure. talk about that because I Absolutely. know that it was um, a, a first for him. Yes. And I believe. It wasn't a first for you though, because you had you had special bulletin before, but it was your first series. Was it you and it Ed's was, first series? It, it's complicated. It was my first series. Ed had worked on a series before, um, but it was the first time I directed anything, and the first time I ran a series. And you know, it was a very big deal for us. And but you um, didn't want it. I cannot believe the cynicism that I heard listening to you two talk today about it. It's like you were trying to throw it away as, as <laughs> so why is that? It was not cynicism. Here's what it was. We, you have to remember how long ago this was. This was in the age when television was the vast wasteland. Right. And we we went to the American Film Institute. We wanted to be movie directors. All we cared about was making movies. Television was slumming. OK, <laughs> and you didn't want to tell people you did television. And, you know, I had this deal in television, which I took so that I could you know make enough money to put a second story on my house, but I didn't really want to do television. And it was our goal in this deal. It was MGM television. Our goal was to make it through this deal and never make anything. Or if we made anything, it would be a TV movie, but never make a series. That would be a disaster because if you made a series, that would be, you know, you might be stuck in it for years and, and then we couldn't make movies. So right. we were passionate about movies. We had contempt for television. <laughs> So, you know, <laughs> what happened was, you know, at some point you have to pay the piper and they called and they said, you know, you're going to have a meeting at ABC and you have to pitch something to ABC to try to sell a series. And I said to Ed, what happens? What what do we do if we sell a series? This would be horrible. You know, and I, I said, <laughs> this would be horrible. I said, what we have to do 
is we have to think of an idea for a series that we wouldn't mind doing if we if we sold it, but would be so ridiculous from a commercial standpoint that it could never possibly sell. And he's going, well, <laughs> what would that be like? You know, and so I said, well, you know, how about the fact that nothing on television resembles us or our generation? At that time, there was only one show on television that reflected baby boomers, and that was a show called Kate and Allie. Oh, sure, of course. Yeah, there was now, no when you show. first came up with this idea, I know it started yeah. in like 87 was when it first ran. Yeah. So yeah, I was, was 32, you were mid-30s? I, I, I was 35, you know. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and so I said, why don't we just do a show about people we know? And he goes, well, 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 but how do you do that? There's no cops in it. There's no doctors. There's no lawyer. I said, just a show about people we know and, and just their lives. And and he had to sort of be talked into it by his wife, Liberty, who immediately said, well, you know, our friend Gary and our friend this person, our friend that person. And and just, you know, all the issues of what it means to be in your 30s. You're trying to have kids or you don't want to you're, you're worried about your marriage, whatever it is. OK. So. We thought no one would want to watch this except people we knew because it was so specific. It was just about the people we knew. So it would be like making a show for your friends. So they couldn't <laughs> possibly sell. That's what we believed. And then when it didn't sell, we'd be free to go and make movies. And of course, little did we know that by being so specific, it ended up being universal. That was a lesson we learned unintentionally that when you really are specific about the lives of very particular people, the very detail of it, the very specificity of it, the very intimacy of it is what makes it available to millions of people who can recognize themselves, even if the circumstances of their lives are different. So we had no idea. Um, and we were at every step along the way, it was, it's ridiculous to talk about it now because it changed our lives and it, and it, it did everything for us. But when we sold it to the network as a pitch, it was like, oh, God, now we have to write it. You know, it's like, well, so, then was, they, it, so was it a quick sale? Was it was it like what you were were you foiled right from the get go? I, I'll tell you exactly what happened. We walk into the network and who's in there. But everybody's in their 30s like us. One of them mm -hmm. is pregnant. One of them just got married. It was like, they are the demographic literally <laughs> sitting in the room. And we pitched them this, by the way, it took us literally three hours to come up with the pitch. We said, there's this character and that character. And, you know, we just sort of threw Wait, some what, stuff And together. what about the name? Because you guys, name you guys created something that became part of the lexicon. Had it we, we didn't have a name yet. I'll tell you when the name, I'll jump to that. Okay. We were starting to write the pilot. And I turned to Ed and I said, what are we going to call this thing? And he thought for literally a second and a half. And he said, 30 something. And I Stop. said, OK, that was the entire conversation, literally the entire conversation, except that then I'm jumping ahead a few months. Once we had written the pilot and and, you know, the network loved it. And then they forced us to go to New York. Because in those days, they had this thing called selling season where everybody went <laughs> to New York. No one had a cell phone. You had to sit in your hotel room for a week and wait to get a call, see whether your show was picked up or not. And so we sat in our hotel room literally for four days. And we get a call on Thursday from the head of the studio saying they love the show. They love the show. They want to pick it up, but they hate the name. They hate this name 30 something. You have to change the name 30 something. We said, well, what do you mean? What, 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 what do they want to call it? And they and the, the the person said they want to call it grown ups, and we went. That's a terrible name. That's a terrible name. We're not gonna we're not gonna call this grown ups. It's thirty something or nothing. The person said, no no no. You're ruining everything and hung up on us. And then the next day he called and said, okay, they're buying the show even with the name. So there was nothing we could do to kill the show. We did wow. everything we could to kill the show because we didn't want to do television. And and by the way, when we got that call on Friday afternoon, saying, your show has been ordered. You're, you've you won the lottery, okay? We looked at each other. <laughs> we didn't say a word. They went for a walk <laughs> up Madison Avenue, like in this sort of like, as if someone had said, okay, you're going to prison for two years. I mean, literally, we were just kind of, we weren't. 
it's not that we were unhappy. It's just that we were resigned to our fate. We had no idea what was coming. We had no idea what an amazing experience this would be. So, you know, it's, um, it was, Ed was very fond of that John Lennon line. From that moment, he would always say, life is what happens while you're busy making other plans. And that's, that's what happened to us. You know, we and had so other as plans. You start, as you started to assemble it, yeah. at what point did you realize, did, did it, did it take for it to hit for you to realize, or did you know as you were piecing it together that there was magic happening? Um, that's a great question, by the way. Thank you. Every part of it was difficult. It was difficult oh. to, to find the cast, to find the right people. Um, and none of them were stars at the time. None of them. I mean, Kenny Olin was sort of a star, you know, but but he hadn't he hadn't started in a TV show, but he had done you know sort of big parts and things. And, and well, now was that a conscious de- was that a conscious decision that you guys made? No, we tried to get stars; they wouldn't do. It. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted Peter Rieger. He said no. He was a star in those days. I love know? Peter. Yeah. Yeah. So, and by the way. We wanted Peter Rieger, and instead Ken Olin walks in, and we go, this guy's way too handsome to play this part. We, we can't have this guy playing this part. That was our first feeling. Wow. It was like, Ken Olin is too handsome. And, you know, we had to be talked into that because he was so great in it. And it was like, okay, what's wrong with him being handsome, you know? So every – and and by the way, let's talk about music, okay? So I had this idea in my head – oh, God, I'm trying to remember it now. There was an Australian – jug band i can't remember what they were called but it was very funky music at that time and i was thinking that's the sound that we want and our line producer scott wine a lovely brilliant guy came to us one day and he said i have the composers for the show because we had been meeting with people and, and no one seemed so right you but us. so you wanted it to have a different sound you didn't oh, want completely it to have different that sound. You, you know everything Everything we did was about because we did not like network television. So we didn't want anything to be like network television because right. we just didn't like that feeling. We wanted it to be like movies. That's you didn't we want it to, to be do. formulaic. You didn't right. want it to be anything exactly. we're used to. Everything yeah, yeah, yeah. had mm-hmm. everything should be what it's supposed to be, which is what you do when you're making a movie. It's just what is it, what are you trying to do and, and what's the best way to do it? It's as opposed to the formula. Okay, so I had this idea of what the music should be. And Scott comes to us one day and says, I have these two guys, these, these songwriting partners, and uh, they've put together a demo of a, of a theme song, and uh, I think they'd be really good. And I said, well, have they done anything before? And Scott goes, oh, absolutely. They're very experienced. <laughs> and I I listened to the thing they put together and it was very good. Okay. So was it the in. thing you ended up with? Not exactly. No, but it was close enough, you mm-hmm. know, it to sort of fit the sensibility that I was looking for. So they come in and, you know, <laughs> and Snuffy, like I had never heard of Snuffy. Okay. But Snuffy was Snuffy. Snuffy was a very famous guy in the music business. At he that was time. a rock star at the time. He, yeah, he was of, a yeah. rock star. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. He just had never written anything and didn't know how to read music. Didn't but, know it. You know, and so basically Scott Winant came in, Snuffy came in, and they just lied. They just lied. It's like, oh, yes, done this before, really comfortable with it. Great, let's go with these guys, okay? And God bless him, Snuffy was a genius. You know, he just was a genius. He was a composer waiting to discover that he was a composer, you know, and I don't know how he did the things that he did back in those days before you had computers and electronics to, you know, I mean, he somehow had to translate what he was doing so that other people could follow it. But I, I never got to the details of that, but at any rate, um, he was amazing. And, uh, you know, and as you know, he's done everything since then for us because we just love him so much. And Quite a winning combination, y'all oh, are. Oh, he's just, <laughs> just a dream. So, but I have, I, I torture him, and I will torture him forever about how we met because it's so great. 
But, so, but there were a yeah. lot of first timers on that show, right? There were a it lot wasn't of first timers. Just... Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Our, our. But by the way, I should, I should have to digress for a second. The, the, the guy who ran the studio, not the network, but the studio, was this guy named David Gerber, who was like an like an old pro from the olden days of TV, mm -hmm. you know, been there from the beginning. And he had this very gruff thing and he would curse all the time. Every fucking <laughs> people, God damn it. And literally half the time you couldn't even understand what he was saying. And he, and we just thought that he was going to be a nightmare because for many people, he was a nightmare, but he just liked us. And he just liked he really liked the script of the, we didn't expect him to, but he really did really like the script. So then we went to him and we said, you know, Marshall's going to direct this. And he goes, Oh, I thought Ed was going to direct this because Ed of course was experienced. So he said, well, no, Marshall's going to do it. Oh, okay. You know, and then we went to him, you know, two weeks later and we said, okay, we found our director of photography. Oh, well, what's he done? We go, well, he's never done anything before. He's the best operator in the business, but he's never been a, director of photography before well, how can you do that you're a first-time director you're supposed to be surrounded by experienced people and we go don't worry david this guy's brilliant just don't worry you know and that was dan lerner who went on to be a director and worked for us for many many years wonderful guy okay so then two weeks after that we go to him we say we found our editor he goes well what's he done <laughs> oh my god <laughs> he's an assistant editor he's moving up no no and it, like <laughs> and by the way at that point he just said i just i give up just do what you want and so we hired stevie who we had gone to film school with and um you know had edited i'm trying to remember what he had done at that point i don't i don't i guess this was his first thing editing but we just knew he was brilliant because he had done ed's student film at AFI and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and, and of course, you know, look, the first film Steve edited, he got an Academy Award nomination. I mean, he's just a genius. Wow. So we knew he would be great. It's like, didn't matter if it was his first time. So there was this generational move going on right there where we were these young guys who felt we had something to say and a way to say it. And we... It was a moment which I now understand was unbelievably lucky for us, where doors were opening for young people, opportunities to do things differently. It was a moment in the business, a rare moment in the business, the late 80s, where the people who ran the business, for instance, Brandon Stoddard, who ran ABC at that time, and other executives were coming to understand that the future of television was in writer producers because that wasn't mm. the case before before that it was the aaron spellings of the world who you know were kings on the mountain who pulled the strings and other people did the work for them you know and starting with stephen bochco i think bochco really led the way mm -hmm. um you know with hill street blues the idea of the writer producer sort of took hold and we were right at that moment where that was really starting to happen and they gave us a level of creative control that no one had before that and people have not had since. And it was an incredible blessing. We were just, we were just lucky to be at that moment, you know? So how long did it take until that? Oh no, we have to do this television show. How long did it take till it turned in? Oh, wow. Okay. We're doing this television show. Well, all right. First we went and did the pilot. Which, Which, by the way, every single person who speaks of that pilot says everybody from Bennett Salve to everybody I've ever heard speak of it say that it was the best written pilot they had ever read. No, everybody. Everybody. You. That's really just that's everybody. Very kind. Thank you. It was look, we had a we had a gas writing it. We loved writing it. Wait, can I all right, so yeah, can I interrupt yeah. this? Because I really yeah. want to I'm a writer. I wanted I, I I'm yeah. dying to know this. When you yeah. and Ed write together, yes, because I just heard about these writers that write together, they're never together. They right. sit in two different places, they pass off to each other. How do you right. what, what's your process with Ed when you guys write together? <laughs> <laughs> we well, the way we do it is, and by the way, I'll I'll get all right. I'll get to what I was going to say in a second. The way we do it is 
sometimes we're in the same room or sometimes we're over Zoom, but it's the right. same process either way. One right. person has the keyboard. The other person is able to look at what the other person's doing, is looking at the monitor. Either in the room, we have a separate monitor so you can look at what the other person's typing. Right. Or over Zoom, obviously, you can look. And one person's typing and the other person is yelling at the person typing, saying, no, 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 that's wrong. Or how about this? And da, da, da. And we just. And is of... one person always the typist? And is. Well, what's, I'll tell you what's interesting <laughs> is that for many years, we would switch off very sort of religiously, like after an hour or two. It was like, you do it, you do it. We'd pass it over. Okay. <laughs> do you but want if... to be the typist or do you not want to be the typist? I didn't want, neither of us wanted to be the typist because okay. it's much easier when the other person's typing. Okay. But, but you have more control if you're the one typing. Kind yeah. Of. But if the other one yells loud enough, yeah. you can sort of get them to change. You know, <laughs> you have to understand Ed, our relationship. Ed and I, by the way, we are the longest living partnership in Hollywood. We have. Okay. We, we have to talk about that too, where that's. Yeah, and been, I just remembered it was yeah. Elton John and Bernie Taupin who never write together. Bernie, oh, there you, you know, go. There yeah, you go. Right. Bernie writes all right. the lyrics and then just yeah. gives them to Elton. They're ne they never write right. together. A lot yeah. of writers are, are like that. At any rate, we've been partners. I don't know, forty-seven years or something like that. Okay, and we're we going to talk about how that started too. We interrupt each other. We yell at each other. We, you know, it's just a very free-flowing kind of thing. We challenge the other one. I mean, I think one of the things we really respect about it, the other and about our relationship is our commitment to honesty. And if something doesn't work, we say it doesn't work. And the other person gets mad and you say, well, there's no point getting mad because it doesn't work, you know? And so we find a way to do it. But what happened just in terms of our process was, is there ever a time when you guys hit a wall and it's like, one of you is like, no, I want this in and I'm not giving this up. Or do you always. Generally. Generally, the way it works is he who cares the most wins. That's uh -huh. generally what. But there are times where, say, he'll love something and I just won't love it. And we'll say, OK, we just give up and we try something else. In other words, to us, one of the marks of a good writer is you mm -hmm. do not become attached to the specifics of what you've done. You mm -hmm. know, we call it killing your children. Killing you know? your babies. Yeah. Yes. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, sorry, but. There's more where that came from. So, okay, that's not working. Let's just try an entirely new approach to that. We often do that, you know, and usually it ends up being better than whatever right. it was we were fighting over. Um, but was, all I was going to say was since the advent of Zoom working, Ed tends to get very impatient. And <laughs> when you are watching someone else and you're looking at their document and they're like scrolling through stuff, it drives you insane because you you can't see it fast enough. It's moving. It's not jumps. really it's, real time. It's not really real time. Yeah. And it drives him crazy. And <laughs> and so now he does all the typing. And it's great for me because I'm perfectly happy uh, for that. <laughs> um, but that's just because he can't stand it when I when I have the keyboard and he has to look at that. So but at any rate, it's a very fluid process. We do it together, um, you know. It, it's uh we have a lot of fun we laugh you know we laugh we bicker we you know it's never not challenging and we're never not trying to get better at what we do and it's amazing after so many years you can still be learning what you're what it's your craft is. so now yeah. that particular so, pilot the yes. 30 something pilot yeah was that was did it just flow out was it arduous was it <laughs> well we the outline flowed pretty well and then in those days by the way ed wasn't a writer in those days marshall did the writing we would work out the stories together and on i was supposed to write it i was blocked at that moment i couldn't write and after three weeks i had managed to write the first act which is crazy i should have been done after three weeks and it was actually an incredible moment in our relationship where Ed came in. We didn't really have a conversation about it. He just sat down next to me and picked up the keyboard and we started to work together.
And that's wow. when we started to write together without one word of discussion. And it's been that way ever since. Just okay. because he knew I needed it. And I knew that he knew. And it was like, okay, now we're doing this. And it worked out fine. I didn't know what it would be like because we hadn't written together. We had done all this stuff together, but I did all the writing. But it worked out great. So okay, that was going to be yeah. one of my questions was how do you decide, okay, I'm going to write this, you're going to direct this, we're going to, like, <laughs> like, is there ever a time both of you say, I want to direct this? Yes. Or... Yeah, but the thing is, when we came into the business, both of us wanted to be movie directors. That's all we wanted to do. I made two movies as a director, and I was so miserable during the process of directing those two movies. And by the way, I'm very proud of those movies, especially the second one a movie called dangerous beauty that sort of kind of still has a following today. You know, I love directing and I'm really good at it. I've won the director's guild award twice, but it drove me insane. It literally drove me insane. I had such anxiety directing. Um, I'm, I'm one of those people I'm a very private person. I need a certain amount of time each day to be by myself, just to process everything that happens. And when you're directing a movie, essentially 16, 17, even 18 hours a day, you are not only with other people, but you're working and everyone's looking to you. Everybody's you know, asking you things. Everybody's asking you. And, but not only that, but you have to be on. You have to be, mm -hmm. you can't say, I have a stomach ache or I'm tired or, you know, I need to take a nap or I'm having a, an anxiety attack. You just can't say these things. You have to just keep going. Okay. And I, you know, I was okay for the first 60 days of shooting. And then I kind of hit a wall at 60 days where it was like, I felt like I was in prison and I had to get out. And it drove me crazy. And then the second movie, the same thing. I was fine until day 60. And then I just kind of lost it. And I realized it was it was a very painful moment for me. Um, Didn't you do was, Jack the Bear first? I did Jack the Bear first, yes. And that was a horrible experience, you know, for all kinds of reasons, not worth going into just the politics of the making of the movie. Mm -hmm. um, but Dangerous Beauty was a wonderful experience. Uh, and nevertheless, just incredibly difficult for me, just because of my own psychology, my own... Okay, you know, but this was the dream. So where did where did that dream start? So you're a kid. You're you're in Pennsylvania. You're you're <laughs> you're, you're you're who right. who's your hero? Who where does this dream start? Where did where does the movie? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I wanted to be a writer first. I started writing when I was in eighth grade. I, I still remember my first short story was a spy story about a guy who was about to assassinate someone and uh i wanted to be a writer and it wasn't until i got to college who, who were you reading then who were you reading like in eighth grade who was oh, uh boy oh, okay well i started reading tolkien when i was in eighth grade and i read uh -huh. a lot of science fiction and i read a lot of history and a lot of fiction and a lot of psychology. I read Freud. I read, I was very precocious. I, I read wow. a lot of stuff. I mean, uh -huh. I would say, I would say most of what I know now, I already knew by the time I was 16 in terms of how the <laughs> world works, how people work and all of that. I was, wow. it's weird, but it's just true. Um, but at any rate, when I went to college, which was in the late 60s, early 70s. Which I read, you did like ancient literature. So like, oh, you were reading Beowulf. How anybody yes, would yes. choose to read Beowulf. Like the I Iliad and the Odyssey. It. I, I loved hated it that stuff. I love Vikings. Uh, I love warriors. I love all, all that stuff. It was uh, great. I loved it. Um, <laughs> at, any rate, at any rate, at that moment in the culture, there was this revival of interest in old movies. And... I went to Brandeis, which is outside of Boston. Mm -hmm. And in Cambridge at that time, there were two theaters, the Brattle Street Theater and the Orson Welles Theater, who showed different old movies every single night of the week. Oh, yeah. And, when I was in college. Yes. Yeah. And that's what we did. At yeah. Brandeis, mm -hmm. once a week, they show, showed an old movie. And so basically, every week I was in college, I saw three or four old movies. 
And it wasn't until years later that I realized that my real education in college was movies. I just didn't know that. Um, but that's what I learned. And I, I adored these movies. They were such a discovery to me. It was a discovery of the craft, the, the level of. Did craft. you ever do theater, Marshall? A little bit, but not. I wasn't. But that a theater wasn't kid. your. That wasn't no, your I thing. I was not you... a theater kid. I was a writer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what I saw, I always had a cinematic sensibility. First of all, I, I always thought I would be an artist, like a painter or something like that. Mm -hmm. I always combined sort of the figurative with with language, and and so the fact that movies were both was something that really spoke to me. That it was a visual medium, medium, and that cinematic storytelling didn't depend on the word but then the word added to it and i was very aware of that and i was just so in awe of the work of these guys from the 30s and 40s you know okay now um, wait you're uh, i'm jewish we're jewish we have parents yes. Yes. how are your parents i don't know what your parents did how 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 are your parents <laughs> feeling about their son who wants to be a writer <laughs> <laughs> well they look i didn't in those days, you didn't really talk about your career very much when you were in high school. That's something kids do now. Like, no one asked me. I mean, I suppose they asked me, but I didn't really. Didn't you have to I'd have a, a career path when you were getting ready to go to college? You didn't, like, say I thought you were just liberal professor. arts? With... Liberal arts, yeah. yeah. Liberal mm -hmm. arts. It's like, maybe mm -hmm. I'd be a professor. I don't know. I didn't. I honestly didn't think about it very much. What, what did your father do? My father owned a small woodworking business and, of course, wanted me to go into it. Um, and there was no chance of that happening, even mm -hmm. though I loved what he did and I've always worked with wood and, you know, that I, I, that was a very important part of my life. And my grandfather was a cabinet maker and it definitely informed how I make movies because <clears throat> uh -huh. I look at making movies kind of like as a cabinet maker, that things have to fit together just so, and the precision of it and all of that and the elegance, whatever. Uh, but they were, when I, I'm jumping ahead. What happened was in college, after I had seen all these movies, mm -hmm. sometime around my end of my junior year, I thought to myself, I, I, I was I was studying all these old epics, you know, Sir Gowan and the Green Knight and Beowulf and all that. And I realized I was making movies of them in my head. I was seeing them as movies. And I thought, oh, wow, maybe I want to be a movie maker how do you do that? It's like, and you're in Boston. It's like that, that was just an unknown, weird thing to want to do at that point. And, and, you know, I talked to one guy in Boston, one professor who had actually made a movie and, and he said, well, you have to go to Los Angeles and, you know, you have to just go there and, and try to do it. And he said, let me warn you that if there's anything else you can possibly do, you'll end up doing that other thing because it's really hard. And so I said to my parents, I want to go to Los Angeles. And at that point, my father completely freaked out. And by the way, I was very close to my father. He, I was much closer to him than I was to my mother. And this was a very, very painful moment in my life because I could see that he did not believe that I could make it. Um, and Oh, please tell me that he lived to see you succeed. He lived to see me succeed a little bit. It was a little bit tragic, but um, he did see a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. But at any rate, it's not like we didn't speak to each other after that. But it was a it was a painful moment mm -hmm. between us. But look, he gave me the money. He, he was willing to send me to film school. And I didn't come out to Los Angeles to go to film school, but I couldn't get hired to do anything else. I was just dead in the water. And so then I said, I think. What, I what was the thought when you came out here? What, what did you think you would do when you got here? <laughs> I, I didn't have a thought. In <laughs> I had no I had made a film. What I did, this guy in Boston said, well, you should make a film. Just take whatever money you have and make a short film. So I made, I had $5,000 from my bar mitzvah. Did you know it. from your bar mitzvah? Did yeah. you know what you were doing? Did you know how to work Nothing. a camera? Did no, I can't tell you how completely ignorant I was. And I, 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 I mean, I don't even want to go into the details of what, put it this way. I rented a woman's house to shoot the film and it never occurred to me that we would have to decorate the house so that it would look like what I thought it should look like, like that a bedroom should have a bed in it, you know, or anything <laughs> like that. We show up on the first day of shooting and nothing is ready. And I, it's like it had never occurred to me that I was the one who had to make sure that it was ready. So that's how stupid I was about, well, you know, any of this. But I made this film. I said, I'm going to Los Angeles. And I'm taking this film. So I go to Los Angeles. I stay with a friend. 
And in those days, all you could do was go through the yellow pages under film production companies. And I called every single film production company in Los Angeles. And no one would even look at the film. No one. Oh. There was one person who was the cousin of somebody. I don't know. I don't even remember. He was somebody's cousin who prevailed upon him. And he looked at the film in the screening room in some studio. This was like a big deal for me. And he watches the film. And when it's over, he looks at me and he says, well, it has a certain primitive passion to it, but it's not going to do anything for you. He said, look, this is what I advise you to do. There's this new invention called a video cassette recorder. This is 1975. Okay. Wow. They cost a couple thousand dollars. Go out and buy a video cassette recorder and pick a television show that you like and record a bunch of episodes of that show and then break down the episodes into their outlines and figure out how they write the show. And I looked at this guy and it was like, he was speaking Greek to me. And also like, why are you telling me to do anything about television? I don't want to do television. You know, I didn't say this to him, but it was like, right, Oh my right. God, this is what he's saying is that I should buy some weird kind of technical equipment and learn how to write television shows. No, thank you. And so I realized I was dead. There was just nothing I, you know, I could get a job washing dishes, but I, there was no way that I could understand to get into the business at that moment. And I had heard about the American Film Institute and I thought, oh, Jesus, maybe I should go to a film school. And so, by the way, this is how the world has changed. I call, I get up my guts, I find their number, I call the American Film Institute, I ask for the admissions department. And this woman named Nancy Peters, who became a great friend later, answers the phone. And I said, hi, I'm, I'm interested in applying to go to go to your school. And she said, oh, I'm so sorry. Our admissions just closed yesterday. You're going to have to wait a year. And I went, oh. And there was something in the way I said, oh, that was probably so plaintive. That she said, "Oh, never mind. Come on over and do a do an application, and 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 we'll see if we can get you. You know, wow, we'll see if we can that just gave me goosebumps. That. That's it was, crazy. It was amazing. That's how the world has changed. You know. And so I went over there the next morning, and I filled out an application, and I had an interview with Franklin Schaffner, who was a great director. You know, did Patton and a lot of what Papillon, all that, and wow. I got in." And that changed my life. What what did you have to do to get in? Basically, I had an interview with them. I had mm -hmm. an interview with him. Mm -hmm. They looked at my film mm -hmm. and they said, okay, he's, you know, he has some talent. And so we'll, you know, we'll let Did you in. have good grades from Brandeis? I had very good grades from Brandeis, yes. Mm -hmm. Not good grades from high school, but from Brandeis, I had very good grades. But they didn't mm -hmm. care about that. I don't think they, they even looked at my transcript from college. Uh huh. No, they weren't interested in that. It was just like, is this a person who could be a filmmaker, basically? So. And so, how did you and Ed meet? And and was it in your head that you wanted to find a collaborator, or was this something you no? No, not at all. No. no. Um, by the way, what did I know? I didn't know. I, I wasn't against a collaborator, but I had no idea what that would even be like. Do you know what I mean? So. I met Ed the first day at AFI because he was there too. And um, so all the stars aligned. Had you not yeah, gotten in that year, everything exactly. would have been totally, totally. Yes. And we became friends because we had an amazing teacher there named Nina Foch, who used to, who was a, she was a kind of famous actress in the forties and fifties. She got an Academy Award nomination once, but she'd become a teacher. She was a brilliant teacher, difficult woman, but brilliant, brilliant teacher. And we did an exercise. She taught directing the actor. And we did an exercise where you were supposed to bring in an object that you had feelings about and talk about the object. And the purpose of the exercise was so that we could learn how people, when they have an emotion about something, it's the word she used, was partner. They would partner with this object. That You would see something going on in the person's head in relation to this thing, you know. They're not just talking about nothing. They're actually having an inner experience while they're talking about this. Mm -hmm. So I brought in a ruler that my grandfather had used as a cabinet maker. And Ed brought in 
a watch that had belonged to his grandfather that had come down to him. So we both brought in something from our grandfathers. Mm -hmm. And at lunch that day, Ed came over to me. We hadn't really talked before. That was like the first week. And he said, you know, that was interesting that we both talked about our grandfathers. And from that moment on, we just became friends, Um, you know, and uh, thank God, you know, we. And so how did the how did the. So how did what was the first collaboration you guys did? Well, we used to help at, at the school. You had to help people with their projects. So I would help him and he would help me. And we just became very close friends in the first year. He had a breakup. I had a breakup at the same time. We went through that together. Um, so, yeah, I think by the time we got out of AFI and both of us looked at what the world was like and how terrifying it was to try to get into the business, I think there was a way in which we clung to each other. It's like, well, maybe we can help each other. Maybe we can do this together. I don't Did think you was... work on each other's student films while you were there? Oh, totally. Everyone. Totally. Yes. Yeah. He mm-hmm. even starred in one of my student films. Yeah. Um, and I, I shot one of his and, you know, we, we were very close collaborators and very close friends. And, and um, it was a, it was a crucible, you know, it was, yeah. AFI was a little bit like boot camp. It was really tough, really tough. You know, it was the first time any of us had really been challenged in our lives. We were all overachievers who had kind of sailed through a lot of different things. And this was the first time anybody said, you know what, that's bullshit. You don't know what you're doing. And in fact, one of the great things about AFI, and it's still true today, is um, when you do a project there, what they do is they bring all the students together and they screen the project. And you as the filmmaker have to sit up there at the front Well, everybody rips the shit out of what you did. And you cannot say one word. You cannot say one word. You cannot defend it. You just have to listen. And it was the best lesson I can. I was going to say that really prepared you for studio notes, didn't it? It it really (laughs) did. But also it forced you to acknowledge that. Mm you're making this thing for an audience. And Mm -hmm. if the audience isn't responding, it's your fault. You can't say to the audience, you know, you don't understand what I'm doing. That it doesn't work like that. If the audience doesn't get it or doesn't respond, it's your fault. It's a very, we used to call it, you know, we used to call it a samurai job or like captain of the ship. Do you know what I mean? There is the, the buck stops with you and it's your responsibility to communicate what it is you're trying to communicate and you better listen when people don't get it. And so I I can't tell you how important that was. So you Um, would do a screening, you would get all this criticism and then you would go back and you'd do another cut. Is that what it would? It was done. You were, no, it was done. It's like your thing's a piece of shit. Now move on and do something (laughs) else and learn from it basically. Yeah. Um, So did you come out of AFI with a piece of film that you felt great about? No, I came out with a piece of film that I did not feel great about because I hadn't fully learned all the lessons. I, I mean, I, I actually, this is a funny story. After I finished my film at AFI. What was your I, film about? Um, it was about being in college during the riots in 1970, you know, the invasion of Cambodia. And it was kind of a comedy about a guy who's in love with a girl and, it was it was sort of a campus comedy, you might say. And it was it was OK, but it really wasn't very good. And I didn't really understand what I was doing. Um, I had an amazing experience right after I finished making my film. In fact, if if I remember correctly, it was the day after I finished shooting the film because I was so in this sort of mode of like looking through a lens and that sort of thing. My friend Vicky Zlotnick, who went, was one of our classmates there, said, there's a film screening at the L.A. County Museum of Art, and you have to see it. It's the best movie ever made. It's called The Seven Samurai. I had never heard of it. So she drags me to see The Seven Samurai, three and a half hours long. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> it was, I, I literally, I cannot tell you, it was like somebody opened up my head 
and just poured everything I was supposed <laughs> to have learned in the last two years into my head all in three hours. I'm going, oh, oh, oh. It's like I it was I I've never had an experience like that. It was wow. like a three hour epiphany. Oh, you can film a scene from the back of somebody's head. Oh, he's in motion. Da, da, da. Oh, that tells what it's like. The things I learned in those three and a half hours that I was supposed to have learned the two years before. So wow. I walked out of the Seven Samurai as a filmmaker. I walked wow. into it not knowing what the hell I was doing. You know, it was and all... who, who were the filmmakers that you loved going into that experience? I loved. Well, by the way, it was all. I, I loved. I mean, Frank Capra was my hero. Okay. It's a Wonderful Life was, mm -hmm. to me, is still the best movie ever made by the far. The name of your production company, yes, there you nothing go. even close. Um, all these guys, um, William Wyler, uh, Michael Curtiz, um, you know, some of the later guys, um, um, what do you call it? Um, I'm just blanking right now. Um, That's okay. Lawrence of Arabia. Lawrence of Arabia, I'm just blanking on his name. Um uh, Great English director. I'm sorry. I'm just having a That's okay. moment at any rate. Because I am um, too. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and so I loved epic films. I, I love the idea of the epic going in there. And I wanted to make epic films. I was going to say, so, is that what you, was that your goal? Yeah, that was what I wanted mm -hmm. to do. And, and in fact, what I wanted to do as my senior film at, at Brandeis was actually a medieval epic and they wouldn't let me do it they said you can't do this it's it's not doable and i kept saying no no i can do it i can do it and they said no no and so they kind of made me do this comedy instead and it's interesting i think about sometimes if if they had let me do that you know it would have been a better film so but interesting yeah so have you ever d well dangerous beauty is kind of it's kind of back. yeah it's, you know, Renaissance. It's something. Yeah. But I always love period. I, I am a sucker for anything period. And I would, any period film, you know, we've written a couple of period films that we still want to make. And yet so much of, of what you've done is contemporary. I know. It's just, you know, <laughs> it, <laughs> life is what happens while you're busy then, making other plans. You know? There you go. Kind of, those and look how much television happen. you guys ended up doing too. Yeah, both yeah. of you who intended to be filmmakers. Exactly. And it was at a time, by the way, you know, just to put a punchline on that joke is that that was the moment in the eighties and nineties when television got really good and movies yeah. got dumbed down, you know, and it was much harder to make good movies starting then because movies had to have an opening night and they wanted teenage boys to come back and see it five times. And, you know, it was, it became a different world. So we, and you guys way, were part of that Renaissance for many years. Ed and I were the only people in the business who did both television and movies. There was nobody else who did both for a long time. Wow. Yeah. Um, and that was important to us because we we wanted to do both because each represented something different for what you know in 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 television we could do the kind of intimate exploration of relationships that that we wanted to do and in movies we could do things that were epic and big and you couldn't do epic stuff in television in those days now you can but in those days you could not and so we we also used one against the other in other words, if you were making a living doing a television series, then you didn't have to make a movie you didn't want to make. So we never made a movie we didn't want to make, which was a great luxury that most filmmakers don't have because they right. need to live, you know. So right. So it was, um, and there were two of us. So one could hold down the fort while the other one went and made a movie, that sort of thing. So. And so how did all these television shows come? For, for two guys who didn't love television. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, okay, so Special Bolton, you end up winning two Emmy Awards. You're very, right out of the box. Yes. H yeah. How the hell does that happen? Well, that was, <laughs> by the way, that was before all this. That was the first yeah, thing. Yeah, I know. Basically. This is the, the yeah. first thing that you did. So how, how do I, you end up winning two Emmy Awards as soon as you're doing something you don't even want to be doing? 
And well, why do and oddly, why do you do that? That that happens before thirty something. Yes. How does yeah. that happen? Because we saw that as a movie. Words, we didn't mind making movies for television. We just didn't want to make television series. I because see. Movies could be different. And the thing was, the Special Bulletin was unlike any other TV movie. It wasn't. There's no TV movie like Special Bulletin was because, first of all, it was shot on video. It was shot to look as if it was actually happening. It, you know, it was meant to look like it wasn't scripted. Um, you know, and it was original in that way. And it was like a like War of the, War Worlds, of the Worlds. Worlds, Worlds. Right. Yeah, yeah. And although we didn't know that, we were congratulating ourselves for a couple of weeks till somebody reminded us that Wells had done it before. And we went, "Oh yeah, right, shit." You know, but. Um, yes, we look, we had a very strong creative vision. We did. We came in, we came, I should say, we came out of AFI, both of us, with a very strong sense of what we wanted to do. And we were very passionate about it and confident about it. We felt like we knew this would work. We knew we wanted to do it and we were going to make it happen. And so Special Bulletin was just a part of that. It's like Ed had this idea that you could tell a story entirely about, entirely through the, 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 the way television news is told. In other words, you never Did got Did people think scenes. it was real when it aired? Yes. <laughs> so, okay. All right. I, I, there's a whole thing about this where we made the film at NBC mm -hmm. and we turned it into NBC. And the head of NBC News, who was Tom Pettit, who, if you remember, he used to be a correspondent, but then he was head of NBC News. He looked at it and he went nuts and he called Brandon Tartikoff and said, you cannot air this. And Tartikoff said, why? And Pettit said, you cannot air this because people will think it's really happening and people will think it's NBC News and it will reflect on NBC News and it's irresponsible. You're showing a nuclear bomb going off in Charleston, South Carolina at the at the end of this thing. You just can't air this. And it <laughs> it catalyzed this huge fight between the news division and the entertainment division of NBC that then wow. got into the press before we were on the air. Wow. So we were already being interviewed by news people about this TV movie that they weren't certain was going to air on NBC because it was so controversial. Wow. And finally, NBC corporate made a decision that they would run 33 disclaimers across the bottom of the screen <laughs> while this was going on. In, in addition to the disclaimers before and after every commercial break. Okay. But at right. the bottom, it would say, this is a depiction of fictional events. It's not really happening. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. In spite of that, NBC received over a thousand calls while it was airing <laughs> and about 400 of them from you know from the area um where it took place and in south carolina in wow. south carolina and you know because people don't read <laughs> <laughs> so yes people believed it was really happening so wow. but it was the, the point was we were onto something and we ran with it and that's we 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 had the courage of youth we had the belief in ourselves that we could make that thing work. And we ran with it, you know, and that's what we wanted to do with everything in those days. I was just going to say, but that's kind of a theme that's run through everything that you've done. Yeah. And there's also an attitude that you two have. Has there ever been fear? I mean, I was just watching the two of you interact and <laughs> wondering, like, are, yeah. are you ever insecure? Is there ever any fear? Because oh, it doesn't the show time. if there is. All the time. All the time. Constantly. All the time. And I think over time, I, I'll give an example. You know, we did my so-called life after we did. I was just going to ask you about my so-called life. Okay, so. How do two men, in, how do you come to do this show? All right, I'll tell you that story in a minute. But just to, okay. just to like to go back to what you're saying, what you know, 10 years ago, whatever, there was some anniversary and they were putting it out on on uh, DVD and Winnie Holtzman and Scott Winan and I went in to do the commentary on the pilot of my so-called life. And we're sitting there doing the commentary. And by the last part of the pilot, the three of us are sitting there sobbing. We're just sobbing. 
And the engineer says, you have to talk. And we said, we can't. You know. And when it was over, we sat there and we each agreed that the reason we were crying was, of course, how pure this show was, mm. how, how unaffected we had been as filmmakers by the demands of television and the business and what people think and all of that, that we ourselves had forgotten how pure we were when we made that show. Wow. So yes, we're insecure and we are affected by these things. And it's painful to have to realize that. But I'm proud that, you know, I'm proud we made that show. And the and answer to your question, you know, we loved Winnie. Winnie worked with us on 30 something. We wanted to do something with her. We were talking about, well, what can we do? And I had actually done a pilot. I had written a pilot for Showtime before we even did uh, 30 something. And, um, and, it was about a boy who was 17 years old in high school. It was very intimate sort of description of what it's like to be really be a boy at 17. And it was something I actually loved and I thought I did really well. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned that to Winnie and she said, you know, I've always wanted to do something about teenagers. And we said, please do it, do it. And she said, well, I don't know what I want to do, blah, blah, blah. And I have to think about it. So she went away and she wrote, a diary of a 16 year old girl in this girl's voice and came back a couple of weeks later, just with this page or two of stuff that this girl would have written. And we were like, we just died when we look at it. And by the way, every single word in those two pages was in the pilot of my so-called life. You wow. know, it was just Winnie, Winnie just channeled her teenage wow. self. And it was just unbelievable um and we said oh my god you we're just we have to do this you know and so we went to abc and at the you know they they liked us very much and they said yes go ahead and develop this pilot so she wrote the pilot and it, it was just genius you could just see it was just genius and scott directed it and it was genius i mean it's the best thing scott's ever done it was we were so proud of that pilot it was just and you know f finding claire which was a whole story in and of itself. Of no. how, how amazing. Well, how'd you find her? <laughs> um, we we had a casting director friend who was working in New York, who brought Claire in before we saw anybody else, um, and um, uh. And she brought in, oh God, I'm having trouble with names tonight. Forgive me. Um, oh, oh, somebody God, said, Clueless. by the way, David Clueless. Lean was the one who directed. Um... David Lean, right. Yeah, David Lean. Um, Thank you, Tony. All right. The star, Alicia Silverstone. Sorry, uh -huh. I'm just having a name issue. All right. So Alicia Silverstone comes in first. She's 16 years old. She's emancipated, finished high school, so she can work as an adult. Uh -huh. Brilliant. Read brilliantly. Just great. And we're like, she walks out and like Ed goes, I, I can't believe it. We we found our Angela. She's she's amazing. And I said, she is amazing. The, but I know this is gonna sound horrible, but she's so pretty that the character Winnie's written just can't be that girl. Because wow. if a girl had been that pretty. Mm -hmm. She would have been treated differently. She wouldn't have had all the angst mm -hmm. that Angela Chase had. She'd have different angst. It would mm -hmm. have different problems. Mm -hmm. It's not this girl, you know. Mm -hmm. And Ed said, "You're crazy. That's wrong." Blah 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 blah. You know. And we went, "Well, okay. Look, I mean, she's brilliant. We'll probably go with her." All right. Let's see this other girl. <laughs> so in walks Claire Danes, who, by the way, is 13 years old, playing 16, wow. had done one acting job in her life. And it's like you're in the presence of genius. And she just like was just the girl. So did then, Ed agree with you as soon as well, he saw he did, her? Except then we had a half hour argument because <laughs> we couldn't make the show we were intending to make with a 13 year old who could only work eight hours a day. Every season, every scene, you know. Oh. And we sat there going, I mean, we I mean, talk about 
high class problems to have to choose between Alicia Silverstone and Claire Danes. I mean, <laughs> yeah. it's not like it's not like this was a tragedy. But the point is, you know, we really felt Claire was the person to play that part. And it was like, how do you make the show? And finally, we said, you know what, we have to change the show. We have to just make the parents more characters, make the other uh... kids make stories about them so that we just limit the amount of time that Claire works because she's the girl. And we never looked at another person. We just, wow. those were the first two people wow. we looked at. And we never, we never, there was no point because you they were both so great. You couldn't wow. possibly beat them. I mean, in most casting, in most casting processes, you're going crazy right up until the end. Are we ever going to find the person? You know, I mean, it, this is what it's normally like is you're never well, Okay, so it. how was it on 30-something? I mean, did you... It was, look, some of the parts were easier than other parts. Timmy Busfield was like, okay, he's in. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like I said, Ken Olin was like, yeah, he's a great actor, but he's too handsome. Too good like, okay, mm-hmm. finally we said, all right, that's, we'll, we'll make that work. You know, mm-hmm. Patty Wedig, they're married. Oh, she should play Hope. No, but she's not really Hope. And then there was the issue of, well, Patty, are you willing to play this other part who has one line in the pilot and accept our promise that you will have, you know, an equal amount of work to do later? And she said yes. And she won an Emmy, you know, but she had wow. literally one line in the pilot, you know. Wow. And, you know, the, uh, it's look, the casting, it's, it wasn't. We've had much more difficult castings than than we did for thirty something. But can, it wasn't can you, without can a you struggle. Can you tell what? Oh, I mean, when we did when we did the Last Samurai. Okay, uh, so it, we have to talk about what it was like to work with Tom first of all. But okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. All right, so the character of Katsumoto, yeah, who, who was played by Ken Watanabe, we did not have a we did not have a Katsumoto till. I think a week or two before shooting and we had been through every big movie star in Japan. And the reason why we hadn't even seen Ken was that Ken was a TV star. And in Japan, those two never mix. And so Ken was not even brought to us for a long time because he was a TV star. Uh And we're like getting desperate. Like we knew exactly who this guy had to be. And finally, finally, Someone says, well, there is Ken Watanabe. You you know, you could look at him. And it was like, oh, my God, that's the guy. You know, but right down to the wire. Right down to the wire. Yeah. All right. So Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise. Okay, we. I. I want this. I. I want the. I want this. I want the story. (laughs) Okay. We. We just watched War of the Worlds. By the way, the the remake. Yeah. Yeah. Have you seen that in the last fifteen years? Uh, part of it. I, well, I it, it is yeah. so brilliant. It, oh, is, it is so it's brilliant. Bri- you can't it's brilliant. breathe. It's, it's brilliant. brilliant. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, go ahead. Okay. Tell me about Tom. Somebody once said, Tom Cruise arrives on the set every morning and says, How can I make your dreams come true today? And that what? is the absolute truth. What? Tom Cruise is the ultimate. He's not just the ultimate professional. He's the ultimate cheerleader and enthusiast for making a great movie. There is nobody like Tom. Tom wow. is remarkable. He is unfailingly polite to everyone. He is among the only actors I've ever worked with when the, when you work with him on the script the conversation is not about his character. The conversation is about the whole story because he's, wow. he is thinking about the movie, you know, wow. then he's going to think about his character. Um, he's amazing. He's just amazing. You know, I'm I so mean, happy to hear that. Yeah. I mean, look, it, it, it's, a, I, I will never forget. He, you know, like that time when he jumped on Oprah's couch, jumped up uh-huh. and down and everyone made a big deal of it. It's like, that's Tom every day. That's Tom. <laughs> there was nothing strange about that. I mean, when we when we were doing the final battle in Last Samurai, and I arrived on the set that morning, and there are 500 extras all with in full armor ready to charge. And there is Tom in his full suit of Japanese armor. He comes over to me, and he grabs me, and he shakes me. And he goes, this is fucking amazing. This is fucking amazing. Like, he's just, 
he's the most oh. enthusiastic person you'll ever meet who loves making movies great. By the way, I just saw I just saw the new Mission Impossible the other day. Loved it. it That's was, another one where you can't breathe. That chase scene, you can't you can't breathe in totally, that scene totally. with that car the, chase. The, the level of craft, the level of concern for detail in mm -hmm. every scene. It's just He's just amazing that way. You know, it's like, look, we never got into Giantology with him. We didn't talk about it. I was going to I was going to ask you about that. Does well, that come up? Is is he, that he, vibe there? No, it wasn't. I mean, look, he he invited us to a couple of Scientology events, which we went to. Um, Did you? He, you went to the yeah. church? Yeah. Yeah. It was like they had their gala, whatever. We went to it, of course. Do they try to take you downstairs for the tour and do the whole thing? There was a tour, but there was nothing. There was there was nothing. Okay. You know, I mean, look, the weirdnesses of Scientology are not going to be seen at the annual event. That's the you know sort of their big thing of the year. Do you know what I mean? And whatever Tom's involvement of, with the weirdnesses of Scientology, I never saw it. So, and I never saw him. I mean, whatever they say about the cruelties you know, committed by the church at various mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. I never saw anything like that from Tom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it, he is utterly accepting and um, positive. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I think like there was one instance, this is Ed's story, not mine. Um, there was the, when it, it, the first few days of shooting, we were actually on the Warner Brothers lot. We hadn't gone to Japan or to New Zealand yet. Mm -hmm. And we were doing this very difficult battle scene in the back lot. And it was, it just wasn't going well. And it was, it was, it, it, poor Ed was just really tearing his hair out because it just was like, this is how we're starting and it's really not going well. And then at lunch hour, he had to go to a marketing meeting with all the executives where they were talking about, oh, this is how much money we're going to spend. And it's going to be so great. And he's thinking, oh yes. And the movie's going to be a turkey and blah, 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 blah. So he comes back. You know, filming is about to resume. They're at the craft service table. And Tom is there and Tom goes, how's it going? And Ed says, oh, I just came from this marketing meeting. And, and you know, it's just it's just really daunting. And, and you know, I just worried about how things are going to go here. And, you know, I, I just want so much for the movie and blah, blah, blah. And Tom just kind of looks at him and walks away. Because... Tom didn't want to be around any negative energy. And Ed was being negative at that moment. Wow. Now, for a Jew, we don't even recognize that that's negative. <laughs> it's like normal. That's just, you know, <laughs> like, she, you ask me how I am, I'm going to tell you, like, I'm anxious about this. And blah, blah, blah. So, wow. you know, so yeah. That's interesting. And, and did I ever really get to know Tom? No. In other words, Tom, there's a private Tom that people don't see and that I did not see. But mm -hmm. by the way, I flew with him to Japan on his private jet for 14 hours, wow. you know, and worked with him for six of those hours on the script. And, you know, I was with him a lot. Okay. It's just, he's a guarded guy. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? But mm -hmm. I don't say that as a criticism. That's his right mm -hmm. to be that mm -hmm. way. And, and by the way, he can also be, unguarded in a in a way that's sweet i mean for instance when we were talking about the script you know he he plays this drunk in the beginning who pulls mm -hmm. himself together but he's kind mm -hmm. of a messed up guy in the beginning mm -hmm. and he had this idea that maybe in this beginning scene i should sing dixie and it's like he could see on my face that i thought that was a terrible idea you know and um we, we didn't get an argument about it. I didn't even say anything. I said, well, let me talk to Ed about it or something like that. And so when we get to Japan, and my, by the way, we get to Japan, he has to walk through 5,000 screaming fans. He of spends course. an hour signing autographs, you know, um, like I'm ready to keel over. And he's just like, <laughs> and we, we, we meet up with Ed. We've just gotten off the plane. I mean, you know, no resting, nothing like that. We just got off the plane. The first thing Tom said was, and your partner here hated my idea of saying Dixie in the movie. And at that moment, he was just a young actor. He was this young, sweet actor who 
was making a joke about the fact that he was embarrassed that he had an idea that I didn't like. And it was just Aww. sweet. You know what I mean? Aww. Yeah. Um, no, he's... How, Tom how about Tom um, how about Leonardo? Um, I just saw... Did you see um, Killers of the I've of not the seen it yet. I have to see it. I've mm. not seen it yet. Yeah, I can't wait. Oh. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so... Yeah. We just did like this little Leonardo film festival in uh -huh. the house uh, uh -huh. last week. And, you know, yeah. sometimes I actually catch him acting. I, I feel differently about him than I do about Tom. I, I, uh -huh. He's quite brilliant mm -hmm. most right. of the time, but sometimes yeah. I catch him acting. Yeah. But in this, he is. Oh, my God. But yeah. so how was he to work with? How was how was that experience? He was great. He was great. He said, again, totally when you say professional, that can mean a lot of different things. I mean, utterly and completely committed to doing a great job. And for instance, you know, a week before shooting, he comes up to us with recordings of three different South African accents that he had mastered, three different South African accents, saying, which one do you want? I can do any of them. Which one do you want? See, he had been studying for months to do that accent. That's you know, he just, he's he, an utterly committed artist. He know? transformed, I mean, it's not fair what I just said, it, because he's brilliant in, in pretty much everything. But the, in, in Killer of the, Killers of the, um, of the flower moon i'm like yes. now i'm saying it wrong <laughs> he he you can't even recognize it. have yeah. you seen the the yeah the trailers no, you can't I, even no, yeah, recognize absolutely. i mean yeah. his face is full he's got his yeah. teeth i mean like everything about him is just a completely different human being it's but by the way this crazy. is what he loves to do like you know when he played howard hughes when he i mean he's just he 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 and by the way, you know, in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, mm -hmm. I don't think he gets enough credit for playing such a lunkhead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, in other words, he's so playing against what people Who think of is. as Leo. Right. You know, mm -hmm. then he bursts out crying at one point, and he's kind of an idiot, and he does <laughs> things wrong, and he can't remember his lines, and it's like his willingness to be the butt of the joke. This is great. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's he's brilliant. Yeah, and I love you. Leo. You've worked with so many amazing people. Yeah. So, okay, so so let's yeah. talk practical things here for a little bit. Yeah. So, what yeah. did you do? What did you guys do over the pandemic? And and okay, so I know one of the things was there was going to be a thirty something reboot because yes. I know Snuffy was yes. I know. that was being. I know. So yeah, it was horrible, <sighs> just horrible. Yeah, and that got uh, killed because everybody two days before shooting, two days because of the pandemic. Uh, because you, know, you, you had to be, let everybody go because you couldn't hold up. Everybody couldn't kept getting paid while it was that the uh, deal. Well, in the end, ABC decided not to do it. And we don't know why we never got we never got a true story because there were conflicting stories. So we don't mm -hmm. know why they decided not to do it. But by the way, we're we are still committed to doing that. And I we still think there's that. a way to get it done because <gasps> we believe in it. So, um, you know, Timothy but that was, did this show, by the way, I had a little chat with Timothy. I had a little chat with yeah. Timothy on here. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think you're not going to have any trouble getting anybody to come no, back. They all, they all come back. Oh my God. Timmy is, he's such a doll. We just love Timmy so much. Um, so, so what, yeah. okay. So you guys were obviously working on that at the beginning yeah, we were part working of the on pandemic. That. We were working on that. And then, you know, the bottom fell out of that. And, um, we did a couple of other things during the pandemic. Um, we wrote we wrote this big epic film that takes place in Morocco in the 1500s that we're still trying to get made. That's a tough one, but it's an amazing story. Amazing. Your dream come true story. here. Well, close. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, not quite back far enough, but, you know, like getting there. <laughs> um, uh, that would be a truly amazing if we get that made. Um you know, we wrote a spec script. Some of these things I can't talk about yet because right. they're, okay. you know, but of we've course. been busy. We've been busy. And um, as you know, this is a very ageist business and we are very, consider ourselves very fortunate to have a seven before our ages and still be working. 
and we are working. We're, we're doing a screenplay right now of the Stephen King novel called Billy Summers. Oh, uh, fabulous. Adaptation of that. So, uh, yeah, we're, you know, we, we, neither of us has a damn clue what we would do if we ever retired. So, like, we are still totally in this game. Um, love I'm it. so I happy love, to hear that. I love Okay, but work. now yeah. let's talk about the world, Marshall, yes. because first yeah. of all, you're an activist, you're an environmental activist. Last week, my yeah. guest was a good friend of mine, um, Ed Bagley who I'm sure well, you I, have to. Of course to, I know. Absolutely. Yes. yes. I'm sure yeah. you've traveled. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Where did your passion for that come from? Uh, that was just the science. In other words, somewhere around 2000, as I was reading what the science was, I just mm -hmm. became really alarmed, really alarmed. And I couldn't get anybody to even take it seriously. And um, I actually, I reached a point in 2005 where I wrote a manifesto where I talked about how we needed a World War II style initiative to fight climate change or else we were all going to be doomed. And through a fluky set of circumstances, I ended up testifying in front of Congress with my manifesto. And there I was with these other environmental people who were much more middle of the road, like Gore's guy there was, you know, sort of come out way less than what I was talking about. And um, of course it went nowhere, but this was right before an inconvenient truth came out. And when that came out, that's when everything exploded. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know. It's like, the, I, I met with Gore like two or three times in that period to try to do something with him, but it, there were too many other forces at play with him. And so nothing ever came of that. So I was, I spent years trying to do my own initiative. Um, and the thing is around 2010, we, we realized that the right was going to be completely opposed to anything on climate change. That wasn't true. Like in 2008, there were commercials with, you know, Newt Gingrich and, and Nancy Pelosi about how we should do something on climate change. But is that so? Oh, yeah, absolutely. But wow. then they figured out whatever it was. I'm not going to speak for them. It could be their donors, whatever it was. They figured mm -hmm. out it was bad politically for them. And so they just all of a sudden it was all a hoax and there's no such thing as climate change. And so back around 2010, which is now almost 14 years ago, mm -hmm. I said, you know what? We're never going to win this battle politically. We're never going to win this battle by telling people to do the right thing. The way we're going to win this battle is by getting people to see that they would make money by creating renewable energy. That if renewable energy was a good investment, then it would take off at the speed at which we need it to. Wow. And I saw that in 2010. It did not happen until the late you know, until after 2015, 2016, 2017, you know, I forget the moment when, when renewable energy became cheaper than oil and coal, you know, but I just knew that was what was going to take. And by the way, you know, Les you're a pretty Biden, smart pretty... cookie there, Mr. <laughs> Marshall. <laughs> I can see some <laughs> things coming, but at any rate, you know, this is what's going to save us. And if people understood that this is a rare moment because, you know, my friends laugh at me because I everything for me comes from World War II. World War II is the touchstone for everything in life of how you can understand how you do things. And, and what I kept saying was what people don't remember about World War II is that the Depression was still happening when we went into World War II. That we came out of World War II. Believe it or not, the Depression was not so? over. Yeah, it wasn't as bad as it was in 33 and 34, but we still had high unemployment. And that we went into World War II and look, you know, 85 million people were killed in World War II. I'm not going to say it was a good thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, 250,000 Americans were killed in World War II and 6 million mm -hmm. Jews. It was, it was the worst disaster in the history of mankind. Nevertheless, we came out of World War II, the richest country in the world, with the biggest economy in the world. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's a lesson to be learned in that, that sometimes the things you need to do to fix the world can be good for business and that that's not a bad thing. And right now, the biggest driver 
of cutting emissions is capitalism. And if people on the left understood that better, we would be even further than we are. It's a good thing Biden does, because in the Inflation Reduction Act, you know, there's a lot of investment in renewable energy and, and in, you know, making it easier for people to make that transition. But people still don't understand. People still think that what's going to happen is that we're going to have to reduce our standard of living and live in tiny houses and not have cars and all of that stuff. It's all crap. It's all crap. That's not what's going to happen. What's going to happen is that we'll have renewable energy and things will be much more efficient and we will create millions of jobs and it will create wealth. And we will I, not I love the sound of all of that. And while you're going there, that's yeah. that's where I wanted to take you. So there's yeah. a there's a debate going on at this particular point in time, I believe. Um yeah. Do you think Hillary Clinton came out today on The View, I guess, and said that if the idiot wins in 2024, it's going to be the end of our country? Do you yeah. do you think Biden has a chance? I mean, his his approval rating is so low right now. Yeah, it's unfathomable to think that yeah. Trump could possibly. Do you do you think Biden can win? It's a tough one. I don't I honestly I'm very worried. Mm -hmm. um, the people I talk to who know a, not, a lot more than I do mm -hmm. say that Biden absolutely can win. Um, I'm terribly worried. You know, as one person said, if he has a bad fall two weeks before the election, we're done. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's it's scary. On the other hand, here's here's what I think people are not looking at. What people are not looking at is how how strongly people feel negatively about Biden. And the answer is not strongly at all. In other words, if you look at Obama, Obama was incredibly popular. Mm -hmm. The people who didn't like him hated him. OK, the people who don't like Trump hate Trump. He's the most hated president in American history, probably since Lincoln, believe it or not. Lincoln's another one, by the way. Lincoln was really hated. Yeah, hated. OK. Nobody hates Biden. Oh, yeah. Some people say they hate him, but they don't really hate him because what's hateable about Biden? Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. What they hate is they are they're afraid that because they because they watch the wrong news, they're afraid that he's has dementia and that he's lost it and blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah. But he's not a hateable guy. He's a good guy. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. it's like, yes, they mm -hmm. want to make him out to be a criminal. It's like they're never it's just not. That's not there. And by the way, if it turns out he's a criminal, I'll be the first one to say impeach him. But I just he just he's not that stupid. Do you know what I mean? And so the, what I'm saying is. The negatives on Biden are. Now we have the Israel thing, we can deal with that, but mostly it's inflation. And, mm -hmm. you know, look, we have a year and. Biden didn't cause the inflation and he has nothing to do with why it's going down. I mean, it's not even in his hands and yet he's blamed for it. And it is going down, but prices are still up from where they mm -hmm. were. And um, we have to deal with that. You know, what's interesting is that prices now, the rate of inflation right now is less than what it was when Reagan was going into his second term. You know, it's like people... There, we're used to having no inflation for so long that people are just freaked out by inflation in a way that we used to accept it more as a part of mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know what to say. I mean, look, my feeling all along has been that the smart thing for Biden to do would be to say, I invite anyone in the Democratic Party to run for president and we should have primaries and let the best person win. That's what I believe he should have done. And frankly, he probably would have won that process and people would have felt better about voting for him if other people had run against him. But mm -hmm. he didn't do it, you know, and it. I don't know. I mean, look, we'll see what happens. A year is a long time. So, um, you know, look, right now there's the horror of what's going on in Israel that has to mm -hmm. be, you know, America's relationship to that has to be clarified. Um I am very worried about the Democratic coalition breaking up. I'm 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 very worried about that. And uh I'm not sure there's an easy path to keep that from happening right now. On the other hand, look what just happened last night. I mean, across America in four different states, 
the Democrats did unbelievably well. So and that abortion you know, deal might actually help Biden. Right? Oh yeah, it, could, it will certainly help Democrats. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. I think. Look, the other thing is shockingly, people mm-hmm. pe- when people look at Trump when he gets convicted, he's going to get convicted of something. Okay, he better. Uh, I think I think uh, in the he would be convicted of something. The the point is, as this stuff, as the trials actually begin, and this stuff mm-hmm. comes out, and people have to confront what a horrible human being his he is approval rating done. keeps going up every time uh, he goes into court. I mean, he's such I an know. idiot. Everything I know, that he says, but just... I don't believe that support. I believe he has a core of support that's thirty percent of the country that will never change. But the other eighteen percent that supposedly support him is very soft. That's what I believe. And um, by the way, you even look at polls right now. Nikki mm-hmm. Haley does better against Biden than Trump does. We should mm-hmm. be more worried about Nikki Haley, you know, and even DeSantis. Um, it's just this is a bad moment for the Democrats. Other than abortion, it's a bad moment for the Democrats because the the left is sort of out of its mind. The extreme left, I mean, and. Mm-hmm. Inflation is bad. I think that's really what people just are freaked out by inflation. They're just freaked out by it because they, you know, they, everything costs so much. I'm freaked out by it. I can afford things and it still freaks me out that everything's so expensive. It's like, it's just, it's not a good thing. So, mm-hmm. you know, we hope the thing is prices don't come down. That's deflation. That's not going to happen. They'll just stop going up. But things mm-hmm. still are going to cost 17 percent more than they did a year ago. And it feels bad, even mm-hmm. if there's no inflation. So it's rough, you know, although thankfully so. the market is uh, coming back around, which is yes. nice to see. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So Marshall, I I am so happy to have had this opportunity to get to know <laughs> you. And I really hope that um, I get to 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 meet you in person and, and oh me too I and can't continue wait. the conversation you are yeah. just a delight and so brilliant on so many topics i'm 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 blown away and thank you for all you've done for oh. american entertainment for my personal entertainment for my bo's life <laughs> <laughs> for his resume oh. <laughs> you're um, so great thank you so much this is so much fun i'm i'm so you glad and i yeah. i just really look forward to to more you more projects from you um that epic i'm not a big epic fan but i'm going to see it <laughs> and um and i really hope you get that 30 something reboot going oh yeah thank you so much thank you can't wait to see you in person me too thanks so okay. much more